come back from it. Hey, Keith. <laughs> How's it going? This is super fancy now. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, it's probably a waste of money to get to have gotten a lot of the stuff. But uh, this wasn't. This saves me like 30 hours um, a month easily for the podcast. Anything that saves you time is always worth it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So it's been nice. Well, thanks for coming up all the way from Marcy. Yeah, it was a haul. Yeah. Almost didn't make it. Here I am. Here I endured. <laughs> uh, so you own Woodland Farm Brewery, as everyone is aware. I do. Yeah. It's, uh, we're coming up on, it'll be seven years in January. Just goes by so fast. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Seven fucking years. I started seven years ago. The Brasserie started about seven years ago. I think Toss and Fire started about seven years ago. So you're in great company. That's it. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, if you make it to seven, you should be able to do seven more. Yeah, as long as you make money. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to open a beer? Yeah, let's do it. What'd you bring? Uh, we're going to start with a special one just for you. Mm. With a child on the way. Yeah. We're going to crack heartbeat. Here in just a few weeks. When's the due date? Technically, the due date is somewhere around Thanksgiving, okay. um, but... She's, I think, in like another two and a half weeks, she's full term, so she could go at any time. Um, I'm hoping that she goes early. Boom, boom. Wow, that's boom, beautiful. Boom. I'm hoping that she goes early, so that way, because my whole family is going to be in town for Thanksgiving, and um, I want them to be able to, like, I want to be able to take the baby over there. Right. But if it's been like the week of, you know, Rebecca's going to be like, no, so... Uh, but if it's like three weeks, it'll be fine. So well, they'll just have to come back either way. Yeah. Uh, all right, Harpy, what is this? So this is a saison farmhouse style beer that I originally first time I brewed it was the day after I heard my son's heartbeat. <laughs> so this is five years ago I brewed it for the first time, and then this is last year's batch, the second batch I brewed. Kind of smells like apple juice a little bit. Oh, that's interesting. It's mixed fermentation, so it's got a. A few of my favorite yeasts in there and bacterias. Subtle, uh, I wouldn't even say it's tart or sour, but subtle funk to it, crisp and clean. Yeah. And really importantly, the Think Drink New York. Think New York, Drink New York label. Um, you know, because, and the independent label. Is that what makes it a farm, is the Think New York, Drink New York? Uh, farmhouse is, uh, it's kind of comes from the Belgian and French breweries that mm. really focused and built up the Saison styles. I always just felt weird calling it a Saison because yeah. I'm American. <laughs> so I just go with farmhouse, which to me just de- uh, designates, you know, it's got a New York State grain and hops, mm. but also generally some sort of farmhouse yeast strain. In this case, a few different yeast strains. So when you were first getting into like making beer, is this the type of, are these the types of beers that you were thinking of? Um, generally I've always really liked brewing lagers and drinking lagers. Um, but I do enjoy a good Saison and barrel aged beers. Uh, I mostly just like to brew beers that I like to drink. So I focus on yeah those areas and I, I fill in the mix with other stuff cause I can't be too selfish all the time. And right. I need to have customers too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I've told this story a few times, but I remember going to a, New York State Brewers meeting at Willow Rock with Big Mike and Pedro, uh, Petro. And I, for the, at the time, I was like following them around with a camera trying to put some stupid video together. And anyways, I got to sit on that meeting and I remember Big like Mike saying, um, obviously none of us want to be making, because they were talking about the, the, top of conver- of top, the topic of conversation was the increase in percentage of New York State products they had to be they had to use for their farm license right. or for a New York State beer, and so Mike was saying it's really not that difficult if we're making the beers we want to make. It's, it's relatively easy to stick you know to go to sixty percent or whatever it is. Uh, he's like, but to make all the West Coast beers, you know, the IPAs that everybody is buying, that's where it's a pain in the ass. And that was the that was pretty interesting to me to think of 
somebody who's making a beer, but it's something, it's a style that they don't necessarily want to make, but mm-hmm. they just have to because it's going to sell. Yeah, and I, a lot of that has, has changed over the last few years. It's 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 up to six, it's it's at sixty percent now, and it was supposed to go up to ninety, but I think they've backed off on that to mm-hmm. allow some more growth. Uh, it's easy enough to use base malt in every batch of beer, but yeah, when you get into some of the darker beers, it's harder to find some specialty malts. But especially with IPAs, you can't really grow well. There aren't a whole lot of sexy hops grown in New York State. So if you want yeah. to do a Citra, and the yeah. the ones that you slap on a label and people are going to buy it no matter what, it's harder to to kind of go that route with the New York State hops. But yeah, um, but in the same regard, there's plenty of great New York State hops that if you wanted to focus on brewing IPAs with a New York style flair, like it's easy enough. Yeah, you know, people will rally behind it because it's good beer in the end. Hopefully, right? It's um. I found at the bar, it's really interesting to get somebody who walks up. First of all, I'm realizing that my tolerance for dumb people is really, yeah, it's growing weaker and weaker. Yeah, as every, yeah every weekend. This guy came up, came up and was telling my wife this story. I wanted to fucking punch this guy in the face. <laughs> this guy comes up to the bar, comes up to the bar, starts smacking the bar, you know, and he's like, he's like, what do you got here? And I'm like looking around. I was like, are you that fucking uh. stupid? I was like, well, I'm a bar, so I've got alcohol. And he's like, what's your best thing? <laughs> I, I hate that like, question. I was like, well, I've got beer and cider and seltzer and cocktails and slushies. Well, what's your favorite thing? I was like, uh, of, of what? Like, what are those categories? Of cider. I was like, the most popular right now is, pump, is the pumpkin spice. He's like, oh, that's disgusting. I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, well, buddy, you asked me. Tell me what you want. <laughs> Tell me what you like. That's the hardest question is like, well, what's your favorite? I, my favorite is completely different than yours. All right. Tell me what you like, and right. I'll find you that. So he was like, so as soon as I said that, he grabbed a bottle of wine that was right by the cash register that had $15 written on it because we're trying to sell it. He was like, oh, what's this? And I just looked at him. I go, did you just ask me what a bottle of wine was? <laughs> and he just walked away. <laughs> Uh, it was, uh, it's, it's getting frustrating. You just lost a sale. Yeah, I did. I lost that $15, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's so, it's, it can be annoying. But anyway, so when people come up to the bar, um, uh, it's, uh, I can kind of steer them a little bit, not so much in the beer world though. That is, I can steer them, steer them for cocktails. I mm-hmm. can sell a cocktail. They come up and they're like, well, what's this cocktail? What's that? Because of the names, and I, I'll explain. I'll be like, "It's a great drink for right, you know." And I can usually sell the cocktail that I want to make for the beer, because we've got a lot of different varieties. That's challenging. I'm like, "Oh, you should check that one out. It's really great," you know. And they're just they'll grab whatever. Right. They'll grab the Utica Club on the bottom shelf, and then bitch that it's four dollars a can. So what are you gonna do? Um. So yeah. So now I've I've always wondered. I was thinking about this over the past couple weeks because we put out podcast with Nate from Rondecoy. We put out a podcast um, this week with Andy from Swiftwater, and that is kind of the progression of a beer maker. Mm-hmm. You know, the progression from when you're home brewing to then 10 years down the road and how that's changed. So, like, when you first, when you all first opened, well, you started home brewing, right? Yeah. I, uh, I started home brewing when I was 20. I was going to school in Oswego to become a teacher. Um. Landed a teaching job out of Oswego through student teaching, and, and someone had retired, uh, and continually homebrewed all throughout that nine years that I was teaching. Mm. Um, and as much time as I spent making lesson plans, I was also spending that time equally reading books on brewing, mm. uh, researching online, finding different methods, building up uh, my equipment at home. Uh, so I went from surely I was going to teach for 30 years and retire at 50, 60, open a brewery then mm. to, well, let's open this brewery, see what happens. Uh, and then I had resigned from my teaching job within six months of opening. So I uh, jumped right into the, the brewing as a business and really having to fine tune things on a, a pretty fast pace. I think uh, when we opened, I'd talked to 
can't remember where he was from, uh, from a, a guy from Ithaca Brewery. Mm-hmm. And his, his advice was if you can knock it out of the park after six months, you're good. He's like, everybody will give you six months of, hmm. you know, a little touch and go with your beers. But after that, you really need to be dialed in and, and spot on with your beers. Hmm. So I, I focused as hard as I could to, to make sure that we were exceeding, you know, a homebrew level. Cause I think a lot of times that doesn't translate when people go from brewing a five gallon batch in their basement or kitchen to brewing a 300 gallon batch. Yeah. So, yeah. What was your practice like going from that? Cause I mean, you're brewing a shit ton of beer, so it's, you know you can't really like make one or two and test it out, right? Yeah, no, and there's no test batches when you're on that scale, yeah. so it's uh, yeah, you sink or swim. Uh, I think we've figured mm. it out, hopefully. Mm. That's wild. Um, yeah, Nate was talking about that. About he was really fortunate. The company that sold them their brew equipment came in for the first like batch or two and helped them along the way, you know, help them kind of dial stuff in going to such a big thing. But, um, yeah, our, our equipment was all more or less outside of tanks and pumps, our mash ton, our boil kettle were all retrofitted. So hmm. there was no, there was no guide to it. There was no manual for us to read. So the first few batches, a lot of it, a lot of it was dialing in volume, um, and making sure that we're measuring properly. Uh, but there was, like I said, there's no manual, so a lot of it was we had to figure it out. My one of well, one of my former partners was more of the engineer mind with brewing, so he could put anything to his spreadsheet mm. and formula wise figure out volume based on everything. So he he and I really together were able to kind of uh, make it work and dial things in pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh... So what was what were like some of the first beers that you all had put out? Do you remember, like the first styles? First few batches of beer we had an IPA, a porter, a Kolsch, which was that's my baby. If I had a, a desert island beer, it would be Kolsch. I would just mm. drink nothing but Kolsch for my entire life. So to be able to brew a Kolsch on a big scale was pretty fun for me. Uh, within a month, I think I had done a barley wine and an Adam beer, which are more higher alcohol beers, which are also kind of my, my bread and butter, my little babies. I love big mm. beers. So it was nice to be able to, to, to mess around with those, um, especially after having done nine or 10 batches and dialing in the system because wasting a lot of money on a huge batch of beer would have really sucked if we hadn't <laughs> figured it out. But Yeah. Um, what was the first beer that you ever made that you didn't sell and that – you oh. kind of like that. <laughs> you kind of like had like. I'm sure there's been styles over the years that it's like, okay, well, I'm never going to do that one again. There's two that stand out, and one of them I didn't learn my lesson on. The first, first one that I should have never brewed was a smoked saison. <laughs> I love smoke. Like, <laughs> how do you get the smoke in it? It's smoked malt. Okay, so it carries through a, a lot of the flavors and aromas of, of the smoke that way. But uh, I, I love smoke beers. And for some reason, I thought that everybody else would too, <laughs> <laughs> especially in a saison, which is even more like particular. Yeah. You know, not everybody's into saisons, and even few fewer of those people are into smoked saisons. Basically, nobody. Um, and the other one was a, uh, it was called sagey, and it was another saison, conditioned with sage. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it speaks for itself. Uh, but the mistake I made with that one was uh, three, four years in, people were asking me. Oh, you should brew sagey again. You should brew sagey again. We loved that beer. And I'm thinking, no, you couldn't have loved that beer. You couldn't have loved that beer. So I, I brewed it for one of our anniversaries, and that beer just never went away. It stayed on tap forever. And I should have never listened to those three people. I think a lot of people have that that memory of of the first few beers that we brewed, and we're like, oh, those were your best beers because they were their first experience with us. Yeah. But no, they weren't our best beers, and I should have never brewed that ever again. Uh, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I can't imagine, you know, like I said, it's not low volume. Right. If I put out a sandwich at the restaurant, like a special that I think is going to crush and it doesn't, great. In a week, it's, I don't have to make it anymore. But you're making hundreds of gallons of this shit. Yeah. Yeah. You you all don't can at all, right? No, we, uh, we just do crawlers and I do bottles of our bigger beers or barrel aged beers. And sometimes I'll do a bottles of a farmhouse, but Mm -hmm. that's it. At some point. 
been thinking about getting into doing some caning and uh, being able to do like four packs of lagers to go, I think would be pretty sweet. Otherwise, we do crawler fills and growler fills. Yeah. But um, even that, I mean, 10 years ago, everybody had a growler in the backseat of their car. Right. And that was kind of the norm. Uh, then crawlers came along and everyone was hyped on those because it's, there's no light, it's better storage. Um, but now people are really just looking to, they want to bring something yeah. to home where they don't have to crush 32 ounces all at once. So. Yeah. Getting into four packs after we open the Holbert house um, mm. will probably be something we'll do next year. Just trying to focus on getting a second tap room open rather than right. wanting to smash my head into a wall for getting too much on my plate at once. So, <laughs> Has that been... I mean, so for people who don't know, you've got the brewery and the tap house in Marcy in Utica, and then you live near Boonville, mm-hmm. and you're opening, which is, that's like, what, 45 minutes? Yeah, it's, it's probably a good 35 or so minutes from Utica. Yeah. And uh, Boonville's in the middle of nowhere. Sure is. <laughs> that's why we love it. There's an old historic Holbert house up there, right, which was, what was a tavern back in the day? Yeah, it was, it was built in 1812. Hmm. It has tavern, was a hotel. Um, a lot of historical figures have stayed there. Ulysses S. Grant, Teddy Roosevelt. Like, hmm. It's a pretty sweet building. It's all stone. Um, the basement is sketchy as hell because it's all stone of 200 years old. Wow. Um, going up into the attic and seeing some of the posts and beams that are still up there that are, you know, two feet wide and just wow. hand hewn. It's, it's a, it's a pretty cool building. Um, but yeah, I, I live in Boonville. Kids go to school in Boonville. I'm on the Boonville school board. Are you really? Oh yeah. Wow. Um, so every time I've driven past this building, as long as we've lived up there, I've always thought like that would be a killer spot for a tap room and it never happened was just trying to build the brewery itself. And two years back, I was approached by someone that runs the social media page for it's what's happening in Boonville, oh, yeah. um, hmm. asking me if I'd ever be interested. I said, yeah, I've always been interested. <laughs> He's like, well, I, I can get you in contact with the guy that bought the building. He's looking for someone to rent that space out. Hmm. Okay, I'm interested. But it was also the summer of 2020. We just come out of being closed down for three months, um, and I wasn't ready to pull the, the trigger on opening another tap room yeah. without knowing, like, I can put all this money into it and hmm. stay open, or am I going to close? All right. Uh, so this spring, we finally started moving towards uh, getting it open. Renovations were slow to start, but we're finally picking up some steam and hopefully open by Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, I bet. It's um, it's definitely a cool space. Uh, it's inter- Boonville, I mean, I can't even imagine. Uh, I mean, obviously, you live there, so you have a better idea of the – environment and all that kind of stuff but i mean what's what is business like in boonville well there, that's the thing is there's there's really not much to do as far as eating and drinking there's right there's three places you can go out to eat yeah and there's plenty of people that travel through boonville headed up north uh winter time there's a lot of snowmobiling like there's a there's a huge population of people that would love a yeah. good beer right love a good sandwich so um, I think it'll be pretty good, pretty good for us, uh, and especially having that historic element of the Holbert House. People are so excited to be able to go back and see yeah. this space opened again. So, yeah. talking about Boonville, I know that this is going to blow up in Boonville. It's going to be on the front page of the paper. Oh God, yeah, it probably will you be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in Boonville two two years ago uh, for Christmas, and we were sitting at my in laws and. They had one of the local newspapers, and I picked it up, and I'm just flipping through it, and there's an article written by Tim Hardiman from Taylor oh, yeah. and the Cook, yeah. and I'm like, oh shit, uh, it was just pretty, it was pretty interesting. But yeah, Boonville, Boonville's a very interesting space. Thinking about running something there, like I don't know. In one regard, I'm thinking you're probably going to be great, like not crazy busy, but you're probably going to do really, really well because. I sure hope There's so. There's nothing else there, right. right? Where else are they going to go? There's that one, the pub, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's it. So you're probably going to do great. And then on the other end, I'm thinking, but it's Boonville. <laughs> like, what the fuck's going on at Boonville? You know, listen to all the Boonville people. I, I love you, but <laughs> no, it's a the, the thing is, it's such a it's such such a small space. Mm-hmm. If I was opening like a five thousand square foot tap room, yeah. in Boonville, like yeah, I'd 
being right. over my head. <laughs> but it's uh, like seating capacity, I think it's 45. Oh, cool. So it's a small little tap room. It'll be cozy. Yeah. Uh, open Tuesday to Sunday. Similar hours what we are we are in, in Marcy. Um, small food menu. Nothing like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it'll. I think it'll do well. And a, a lot of my beers, I tend to think, lean more towards people that aren't craft beer drinkers, quote unquote. Right. Um, I do a lot of lagers, a lot of easy drinking beers. So, I think it's going to be very approachable to people that might not necessarily be used to. Yeah. Craft beer mm-hmm. might take them some getting used to, but yeah, they'll find something they like. Hopefully. Yeah. My our our, fr- our family up there only drinks Bud Light. Mm-hmm. And uh, whenever grandma comes in, sometimes we get well, actually we, she always she always drinks Bud Light when she's here. But they're from Iowa, so like when we're in Iowa, it's Bush Light. Um, yeah, they got those camo cans. You got to get that right, <laughs> <laughs> and the apple ones, right? Uh, which I haven't had yet. But yeah, I think it's gonna be really cool. It'll be awesome to you know. I mean, I think if you think of like a quintessential brewery, I think of either like a small town country place like that. Or I think of like some sort of a hip, bigger city, mm-hmm. you know, brewery. I, I always looked at beer. Also, it's it's a uh, it's very much your working man's drink. Yeah, All right. And I think that's Boonville. Yeah, you Pe- know, people aren't drinking Cosmos in Boonville. Right. Yeah. Uh, although maybe maybe they will. Maybe if you and we'll, we'll test uh, it out. Yeah, <laughs> you do a Cosmo <laughs> beer and see what happens. <laughs> um. Yeah, that'll be cool. And I'm sure it's going to be nice to have a space that you own that's right there in the hometown. Yeah, it's a, as opposed to a 35, 40-minute drive, it's five minutes from my house. Yeah. It's so much easier to maintain and, and keep a finger on. Yeah. So just to get the rumor mill going, is it true that you're going to be closing the one in Marcy and moving everything to Boonville? <laughs> yep. We actually closed the Marcy Brewery yesterday. It was sad, but we had a pr- pretty big going away party. Um, it it was nice to say goodbye to all my old friends. Yeah. But yeah, no, Boonville's <laughs> home now. <laughs> uh, brewing everything up in the attic. Yeah, can you yeah. can you just edit that clip and <laughs> yeah. put that out in like a quick 10 minute, 10 yeah. second video? Yeah. Spread it out. That would be hilarious. good. <laughs> now I'll do 30 seconds of dead air and then the last five seconds. This was a joke. Just kidding. Yeah, that would actually go really well. I should start doing that. I've been trying to think of like the controversial things that I need to put. Because this podcast, I mean, we have a small audience, which is fine, but. Um, like I've been watching Mr. Beast interviews because he's done like every podcast, like every big podcast in the world over the past month or so. So I keep listening to all of his interviews on these different podcasts and just talking about people's attention spans today. You have to be quick. Everything has to, you have to jump and jump and jump and jump. You can't do anything that's long winded and like build the story, you know, it just has to go. Mm -hmm. And then thinking about this podcast and how they're like hour or two hour long conversations just about whatever. Right. And so I tried it with Tim to do like things, controversial things that we could say on the podcast that then I could use in those clips. Um, but the thing is, I'm, de- you know, like, I'm not dealing with uh, the sounds. Uh, I'm not, I'm not like interviewing celebrities who are on here thinking. I'm not a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, right. You're a local celebrity. Dang it. Uh, but I'm not dealing with like major worldwide celebrities that are thinking to themselves, hey, I need to get on the news cycle. Right. You know, none of that. So I'm not really going to get in a podcast guest in here to be like, man, fuck Willow Rock. I fucking hate their beers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Which I don't know. Are you allowed to say that kind of shit? Because I know, like nationally, you're not. You can't degrade another brand. Is that true? Yeah. But well, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's attack every. Let's go after Tim. Go Buried after Acorn Tim. is garbage. Where's the camera? I want to look right into it. It's garbage beer. <laughs> say it one more time from the top. Buried Acorn is garbage beer. <laughs> that's that's the clip right. I there. think it's all infected. <laughs> so many of them are sour. It's gross. Yeah. It's the smell, what it is. It's the smell from across the street has infected the barrels. I actually, yeah. I don't want to get the rumor mill going again, <laughs> but I heard that's actually what they use to brew with. Oh, really? Yeah. Is the poop? It's a, Yeah, it's a straight sewage. Oh, wow. That's wild. Man. Yeah. No, oh. they don't even use dark malt in their stout. It's true. I wonder if that's why the beers are so sour, because he's trying to cover up some other tastes. I think smells. that's it. Yeah. I think that's it. That's interesting. Yeah, that is going to go out as a clip. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, we love you. <laughs> oh, 
Although you're not, I don't think he's crashing. Um, uh, what's been the biggest challenge over the past seven years? Uh, biggest challenge, uh, having to do an expansion at our brewery while being closed down for three months was a challenge. More mental than anything, because uh, in the end, it all worked out. We got our expansion done. We actually finished renovations like three days before the state allowed us to reopen. Mm. So like timing-wise, worked out. But yeah. headache-wise, that was probably the biggest one I've had of the, the seven years. Uh, otherwise, it's just growing the business of the, the, the first few years of six, seven days of, of work a week, going in at 10 o'clock at night and brewing into the morning because my kettle was electric fired and we couldn't run the kettle while the kitchen was open. <laughs> so I had to brew at night. Like a, a lot of those things were, were stressful. Um, but finally working out those kinks, the expansion helped us to solve that problem to where I can have a somewhat normal brew schedule. Mm. Um, and I've got now plenty of space for equipment, whereas before we were in a tiny little yeah. space in, in the old brewery. So the headache of those few months of being closed down in the expansion, totally worth it mm -hmm. in the end. It's hard hard at the time to have that perspective, but. Yeah. It's, um, do you get, I mean, I know Utica, it's not like there's this major metropolis, but do, you know, like where do most of your customers come from? Because you guys are, I mean, you're Marcy, which is a little bit outside of Utica, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a lot of our customers are, are local. We get a lot of people in Marcy. Summertime, we get a lot of traffic because we're right off of 12. So people that are headed up north to the Adirondacks, it's a quick, easy stop. Mm. Um, but yeah, mostly North Utica area. Yeah. Because hmm. there's not a lot. I mean, the other breweries that are in the area, you've got Bag Square that just recently opened, right? You've got Seven Hamlets or Seven Hamlet. Yep, Seven one. Hamlets. And they're, they're in Westmoreland. So that's the other side of Utica. There's mm. Copper City in Rome. So we're all pretty fairly spaced out for the size of our county and the populations yeah um so we've we're all able to keep our own regulars and then you've got your craft beer drinkers that are going to rotate and travel across them all anyway so it's 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 been good people always ask uh what do you think there's too many breweries in the area yeah. it's like no there's 50 pizza places in utica yeah so i think uh having breweries is never an issue yeah especially if you if you can build the culture of trying other beers and, and seeing what beer is yeah. yeah do you think are you do you take it upon yourself to be like the one i mean i, I don't know much about the beers at those other places um but do you take it upon yourself to be like different in the beers you put out from them no i think more than anything i just try to focus on brewing the beers that i love yeah um and i think i think Breweries can differentiate themselves in that way. You, I think you go into a you go into a brewery you've never been into. You can see from the menu the type of beers they're into. Um, I think by looking at our menu, it it's clear. I've got four, five, six lagers, big barrel aged beers, and then stuff in between. You know, always got to have an IPA, a pale ale. But uh, I think it's easy enough to distinguish yourself that way, and especially if you're if you're nailing the beers you really like. Mm -hmm. I think that helps. Yeah. Um, I think we're, I always say Utica's 10 years behind the craft beer world and the, mm. and the better part of the country. Um, I don't mean better, like their stuff's better than ours, but you go to Denver or Portland, they've got 60, 80 beers in a city mm. where you can go, you know, this brewery, all they do is sours. Mm. This brewery, you're going to get your IPAs. This brewery is your lager brewery. Uh, in Utica and, and areas where we aren't able to get real niche yet, mm -hmm. you kind of have to have a, a good spread. Um, so I think the the only way you really differentiate is focusing on the beers you like and nailing them, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I was thinking about that. I was going to ask that is, I mean, do you, is there a space, and I mean, maybe it is in those bigger cities, is there a space for a brewery where it's like, hey, we just do IPAs and that's it because we've perfected it and that's all that we're going to serve? Uh, I mean, in New York State, there's there's plenty of breweries that, that do that now and then hmm. fill in the gap with, you know, throwing your pastry stouts or yeah. other things like that. Uh, I think you could easily get away with it in New York State. It just might be a harder sell for some people. Yeah. You think up in upstate that that's possible, or is that more of like a downstate? 
I think it, it's twofold. I think you need a population center and you need a culture of beer. Yeah. And I think the only way to build that culture of beer is by having 5, 10, 15, 20 different breweries mm. opening and s- slowly building their niche. I think, like, I'll bring up Tim again. He focuses on sours, but he also has 10, 15 other beers yeah. to, to, to fill in the mix. Um, and I think that's really how it's done is slowly introducing people to mm. different styles of beer, types of beer. Yeah, that's interesting. It's... Um so what is a what does a what does a city that lo- has a great beer culture look like? When someone walks in, <laughs> yeah, and they don't ask, "What do you have here?" <laughs> <laughs> I think is when you know you've got a good beer culture. Yeah, I, you're always going to get someone that comes in and asks, like, "Oh, what, what do you have that tastes like Mick Ultra? Do you have anything like a Blue Moon?" I think you're always going to get that, but. The less and less you get of that, I think the closer you are to actually having like a beer culture where people walk into a place and they know what they like hmm. and they know what to ask for. But a lot of that, I mean, our bartenders still, after being open seven years, a lot of what they do is education. Hmm. Yeah. Like introducing people into to beer and talking them into beer. Um, it's really a slow progress to get, to get beer culture established, I think, in, in some of the cities that are a little behind. Yeah. I've wondered about that, you know, I mean, doing running the social media for Willow Rock. And I don't think that they, I don't think, um, well, I know that they're not thinking about trying to convert necessarily uh, the average drinker into an enthusiast. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just trying to make beer that people want to buy. And, and trying to figure out, I think, what that is that people want to buy. Also putting stuff out that they enjoy. I think it's, I think I won't say that they're the one, but they're just being so connected to them. I can kind of see that um, system of balancing. I really like this beer. I wonder if it would sell. Let's try it. You know, or well, yeah, you know, whatever. So that's mm. that's been really interesting to see. Um, but I don't know of many people that have said besides like, kind of what you're saying now and what it seems like you're saying. I don't, I don't know many brewers that have said, you know, I want to take someone to be a craft beer enthusiast. You know, they're saying, I just, you know, I'm going to make the beers. I hope they sell, you know, right. they'll sell if we do them well. But I don't know of many people that are trying to, and I don't think you're sitting here saying, hey, this is a hop. You know? Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're going to get someone that comes in asking for a Mick Ultra or a Blue Moon to then spend $18 on a barrel-aged barley wine that spent two years in a Blanton's barrel like that. Yeah. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah. But I think getting people to know when you walk into a craft brewery, like I can find a lager, I can find mm-hmm. a beer that I'm going to enjoy and not get freaked out. Yeah. You know? All right. It's, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, hmm. Shoot. What was the question? I was just going to ask you. I was going to ask you a question. What was it? What was it, Keith? Um, what do you do here? What do you have here? <laughs> what do you have here? Um, what's, what's, what's your favorite cider? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's definitely... Yeah, that, those are fucking annoying. Um, yeah, there's... I mean, there's a lot of questions like that. It's, uh, <laughs> what's your hoppiest beer? What's your darkest beer? And then you can give them a beer that's not hoppy. Yeah. And a lot of times it'll be, oh, this is too happy. A couple weeks ago, <laughs> one of my bartenders, he came back to talk to me because whenever whenever anything crazy comes across the bar, like they have to share with me. Of course, it's, and I need to know it. I need to hear it. The uh, customer says after drinking our Holbert House Hellas Lager, mm-hmm. probably our least hoppiest beer on tap, just super crisp, clean German style Hellas Lager. He told my bartender, you need to tell your brewer to dial down the hops. This is way too hoppy. I'm like, <laughs> I've, I've brewed the same recipe under different names and iterations over the last five or six years. It's literally our least hoppy beer. But, like, <laughs> I, I guess that's where you, the, the beer culture needs to kind of yeah. – you know, people should hopefully catch up soon. And hmm. I think a lot of that is also people don't, people don't know what terminology is. They hear the word hops. Yeah. They don't know what that means a lot of times. Like, so All right. it's educating. Yeah. And, dialing it back for people like no 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 (laughs) it was just up until recently it was actually like a month or two ago i had a lady at the bar 
I made her a drink and she was asking me what goes in it. And so I was telling her and, and, um, kind of taking pride in it. And uh, we've used, uh, Mexican chocolate bitters in it. And so she was like, Oh, what's that taste like? And I had never tasted them by themselves. And so I was like, Oh, they're, you know, they taste like bitters. <laughs> She's like, well, can I have a taste? I was like, you want to taste just the bitter? She was like, yeah. So I put a little few drops in a bar spoon and she was like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. It's really peppery. And I was like, yeah, it is. And then when she left, I took all the bitters that we had and I tried one by one mm-hmm. to really see. So it was like, oh, okay, so that's what that does. Um, besides just saying, here's the recipe and I'm going to make this and then this is what the finished product tastes like. Uh, right, to know the sum of its parts. Yeah. Everything about it. Yeah. Right. Um, the question I was thinking of earlier was, uh, what's it, like, how does drunk culture fit into craft beer because i mean obviously you're you know we're selling a product you're selling a product making a product that is going to get people fucked up so but you don't really see a lot of people a lot of breweries talking about or trying to have fun with that part of the culture of drinking like specifically getting people drunk well (laughs) not like not like we do that pretty well (laughs) i'm not talking about show up we'll get you fucked up but you know the bigger brands you all, like the national brands, you always see them, I mean, you know, especially in the seltzer community, talking about, you know, having a good time, going out, you know, all that kind of stuff. You don't see that in, like, a lot of craft beer. Well, I think it's it's also, you don't see, you don't see breweries doing, like, wet t-shirt contests. <laughs> but, but the question is, should you? <laughs> and will you do that in Boonville? We're do- um, our opening weekend in Boonville, we are, in fact, doing a wet t-shirt contest. I'm You're gonna- invited. <laughs> I'm going to take all of these crazy Boonville clips and do a compilation and tag the Boonville community Facebook page. Yeah, nobody's coming to the Holbert house now. I just ruined it. Well, we'll see. Well, the average age in Boonville is like 67, so to do a wet t-shirt contest up there may not be. Yeah, I won't be there that day, but my bartenders will. Uh, that's pretty funny. Uh, but I think... Uh, uh, I th- like the wet t-shirt contest is obviously a joke, but it's it's kind of it, it's kind of telling of where like craft beer is versus where you know your your big breweries are and, and what their mm-hmm. focus is on. Um, I think craft brewery one thing that we have that they don't have is we have community. We are real people. Mm-hmm. Like you can't you can't go to Baldwinsville and find the Budweiser tap room, right? You know. Um, so I think that's that's something we have that they'll never have. Yeah. That's surprising that you can't. They should. I know. Why don't they? It's probably not even worth their time, really. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, I've heard that the culture there has changed a lot. A buddy of mine used to wor- work there. He's worked there for like six years. And he was saying there's like their staff meetings, all that kind of stuff. Always, there's like an employee bar there. And they always take place there. Like third shift, you're there at seven in the morning drinking, and you can drink as much as you want for free. And so staff meetings, people are always getting hammered. Mm -hmm. And now apparently over the past like two or three years, that's changed, and they don't encourage that whatsoever. So, um, yeah, you would think that Baldensville would have something like they would have a Budweiser tap room or something. Yeah, a little Anheuser-Busch tap room. You know, people would... Love to see the Clydesdales in there a couple of times a year. I don't know. They could they could definitely do something with it. Yeah. I'm surprised they don't. Yeah. What um do you ever I mean, do you ever want, you know, your the brand to get to something like that's that big? I mean not Budweiser, but that's like massive. No. No. <laughs> that's terrifying to me. Uh like right now I brew all of our beers and ultimately that's the only thing I want to do. Yeah. If I could slowly Step away from managing the books, scheduling staff, dealing with meetings. If I could just brew beer, that's all I would ever want to do. That's the dream. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, and retire in ten years. <laughs> but I'd yeah. rather just brew. Yeah. Um, so, building a brand to a point of having wide distribution across the entire Northeast that has that has no appeal to me. Mm-hmm. That just sounds like a huge headache. Yeah. You know. I, uh, I've always thought that working working more for less doesn't seem worth it to me. I'd rather work less mm. for more. Yeah, just brewing beer. Yeah. That's it. Would you do that if you if it meant like, hey, you're gonna? Well, because you had partners, but you bought them out, right? Right. Yeah. 
was that kind of the setup in the beginning was that you were just a brewer? Yeah. Uh, when we first opened, there was three of us, our one partner kind of did the licensing paperwork, bank meetings. He kind of got the ball rolling for all of that stuff. Uh, I focused on brewing beer, obviously. And our third partner kind of did a mix of all of those things, but engineering kind of mindset helped me with equipment on the, and that aspect. And then it slowly turned into our first partner that did all the paperwork after a year. He wanted out. So Nick, my other partner, took over the business end of things, figured those things out while I was able to slowly dial in the things that he had done. Mm -hmm. And then he was looking to get married, teaches, Mm -hmm. was coaching three sports, wanted to start a family, so approached me of, Keith, if you have a way to to buy me out, let's, Mm -hmm. let's figure that out. He said, I just don't have the time to invest in it anymore. So the timeline worked out pretty well for me to slowly learn those things, to transition. Because if I had opened on my own, I would have, I would have been dead. Like, there's no way I could have figured all that out on my own. Hmm. Um, just look, like I said, with brewing, you have six months to really dial it in. Yeah. I couldn't have dialed that in and handled all those other things at the same time. Maybe I could have, but I probably would have had a lot less hair than I do now. <laughs> Not that I have much. Um, so it was, it was it was a good progression of, of things from start to where we are now to to slowly figure out the full aspects of of running a business yeah. and brewing beer because yeah. um, everybody wants to everybody wants to open a brewery but they don't realize what all that entails like right. people always ask can I come in on a brew day and help you brew beer <laughs> no are you good with a mop can you come in the day after and help me clean up because that's my least favorite thing to do like, yeah. that's yeah there's there's a whole lot more to it that that I don't think people realize is, is yeah. part of brewing. Yeah, because it's like really, at the end of the day, to be a great brewer, you have to be a great cleaner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's places, you know, obviously there's like the big one, there's the big breweries in our central New York area. You know, I'd say, I don't know if Myers Creek, maybe with their contract brewing, they've eclipsed Middle Ages, but I don't know. But you've got Middle Ages, which is obviously mm-hmm. the oldest, and, you know, let's say it's the largest. And then Empire, you know, which they started around, or they started after Middle Ages, I think. But Empire, it was getting huge. And then, you know, they obviously went defunct. Um, and Myers Creek, you know, swept in and bought up, you know, all their shit or took it over. And uh, and now they're, you know, massive. Um, which we can get into that later. But, uh, you know, if you, I'm, su- I'm surprised... There haven't been, the only brewery that I know of in the area in the past, like since I've been doing this, it's gone out, was IBU. And that wasn't even because of business or anything like that. That was more for personal reasons, which is, that's kind of surprising. I don't know. I'm just now, as I'm saying this, getting up to my question, I'm thinking, it's amazing. You don't see more breweries go out of business. Yeah. Part of me almost suspected there would have been more of that over the last two years. I think uh, a lot of the grants and PPP that went out to businesses helped float them through yeah. some of the worst of it. Um, As it was, it's just so cheap to make. I mean, it's not cheap to make beer, but the ingredients in beer are so inexpensive. Yeah, but I mean, even all of that's increasing. Like every yeah, everything with supply chain and all that is, is gone crazy. Uh, and I don't even think we've seen the worst of that. I don't want to get into that right here, but yeah. like, I, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't think we've seen where this is all going um, no. over the next year or so with not at all stuff. So. It's all going to fucking crash and burn. Uh, <laughs> yep. That's that's why I live in Boomville. I'm just going to get a couple of goats, a cow, and I'm going to be fine. <laughs> and you'll be at the whole brew house. Yep. yep. And you're moving the whole brewing operation <laughs> up there, so you're going to be great. <laughs> yep. Won't even have to leave my house. I'm actually just brewing out of my garage now. <laughs> it's pretty good. Now, that would be my dream. Rather than really? get into big distribution, just to be able to brew in my garage and never leave my house. I forget the name That's of it. the series, but there was a, and I forget if it was Netflix or Hulu. A couple of years ago, they put out, I think they put out, they did put out two seasons of it. And each episode was a different story, like a different cast of characters and everything. And it was really well produced um, just before kind of wokeism. So it wasn't like ultra that, which right. was great. Um, but there was this one episode. It was. What's James Franco's brother's name? Was an actor. I forget his name. He's got a brother. Yeah, he has a brother who's a good, who's like a famous actor as well. Uh, Mike. I think it was like Dan or something. 
anyways, he plays he plays one of the brothers in the or one of the characters in this episode. And the thing is, like he that character, they live in Chicago. That character makes is like a very talented home brewer and has like a cool painted garage and they've got like, you know, some tap set up in there and um, you know, music and chairs and all that kind of shit. And he's constantly got people and friends and like fans coming by to buy, um, coming through to purchase uh, like growlers of these home beers that he's making. And so he's created like this illegal side business doing it. And his other brother who older brother, who's like has money and is in business for his career and is like about to have a kid who's going through that stage is like, I want to invest. Let's start a brewery, you know? And so they wind up doing it. And then the next season, they have this massive brewery in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. <laughs> <You know. laughs> just that um, easy. Just like that. Uh, but I'm so I'm I, I'm surprised that, more, that there haven't been more breweries that have closed. And I'm but I'm I'm also surprised that there haven't been more that have joined forces to create a bigger space, like a b- bigger brewery. I would never encourage anybody to open a brewery right now. Really? Yeah. Uh, just like having gone through the expansion and then now just minor renovate renovations, like cost of stuff is yeah out of this world. I think, uh, although I don't know if that's ever going to come back down, so maybe just go ahead and do it if you've <laughs> got the money to. Um, but I think I think the ROI on a brewery right now is a lot different than it was ten years ago. Mm. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's the only reason I'd be hesitant to, to yeah. jump in right now and open a brewery. Hmm. I know like there, there's breweries that opened during COVID and the pandemic, the, in, in Utica bag square brewing and seven Hamlets both opened like the month or two of having shut down. So they opened up while only being able to serve beer to go. That's crazy. So I, I guess it can be done yeah. and you can survive and, 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 and still grow your business. But yeah, man, I, I would just be hesitant about how much, how much you're going to make off of what you have to put into it right now. Yeah. I mean, cause but the I, game isn't the sum of one, it, you know, it's not, it's, you know, it's not the profits from one. It's the sum of, you know, an entire week of trying to knock it out. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think it would be fun. I can't like I would never enjoy I, I wouldn't even enjoy home brewing, um, so I would never want to do that. But it's just uh, I think like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, what would it, what would it look like for Tim and Keith to combine forces and open like and have one big brewery, you know, have four locations and put out be able to put out like bigger beers or more mass distribution or whatever, or one focus on like the craft stuff and like the true craft beer. And the other one focus on like the other side of the business, focus on like the mass distribution of, you know, the IPAs and all Mm. that kind of crap. Um, And I'm just surprised that I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything like that happen unless it's, I don't think, I don't think they're merging, but I think of Isaac talking about, like FX Matt and all the contract brewing that they do. And I th- maybe that's like kind of sort of this, you know, you know, it's like, I think it's, it's like 70% of their, I might be off, but it's, it's a good chunk of their, their brewing capacities for contract brewing. That's not because what's the big one in New York city? That, uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn is FX Matt does their contract brewing now, right? Yep. Well, they've, it's been a while. It's probably been 15 plus years. That Holy shit. Yeah. They, uh, if you look right on the label, it says Utica, New York. That's wild. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is cool. Uh, I mean, in a way, I don't know why I've always felt this way about bigger breweries, uh, considering I have zero skin in the game, but I'm always like, fuck them. <laughs> Just- <laughs> Anytime that there's like a, like, uh, fucking Myers Creek, I fucking hate him. Empire, <laughs> I fucking hate him. <laughs> FX Matt, fucking hate him. I don't know why. It's, it's just that, uh, intrinsic or that natural tendency to always root for like the small guy maybe yeah. um i am um, i will never do business with myers creek 
for the sheer fact that they opened up around the corner from Tim. And even though Tim's like, hey, that's great, makes fun of him, but, you know, whatever. To me, I'm like, you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> you could have gone anywhere yeah, else. Yes, yeah. anywhere else in Syracuse. You wanted to open up around the corner from Buried Acorn and really almost around the corner from everyone else downtown. Right. Like, I have, I have any brewery who had the fucking money to go anywhere and create something, and they decided to dump a million dollars into that place, fuck them. Can't fucking stand them. I don't know why, <laughs> other than the reason I just stated, but yeah. Uh, yeah. I got nothing on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to drink another one? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What do we got? This is uh, Barrel Pull 2. And this is a series that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, they're uncarbonated, mm. completely still. Really? Big barrel-aged beers. So for me, the thing I love most about my job wow, look at is that. my barrel program and being able to taste beers directly from the barrel. Mm -hmm. So the thought was if I bottle this flat and encourage people to kind of serve it more cellar temp or room temp, mm. it mimics that barrel pull process. Mm. Like I can't, I can't bring people back into the brew house and all day long, serve them from the barrel. Yeah. This is kind of the, the next best thing. Although that would be a cool event. It would be. I'm thinking about doing it. It would be a mess. Talk about promoting drunk culture at a brewery. I think that would be the way to do it. Uh, all right, let's drink. Wow. Mm, that's not what I thought it was going to be. So this is actually a pretty cool beer. Show it to the camera. Am I in there? Yeah, right there. Got it. This is an Imperial Stout. It's an oatmeal imperial stout. So it's got mm. some velvety smoothness from the oats. But my favorite thing about this beer is it came out of an oak barrel from Adirondack Cooperage, mm. which is in Remsen, about 15 minutes north of me. Yeah, um, They make killer barrels. And mm. I try to, with this series, kind of pick some of my favorite barrels that have a good story. Mm. The beer's good, too. That's cool. um, but that definitely excites me to be able to say, got that barrel from yeah. 15 minutes north. Can you get, can, like, so the bourbon, historically, you can't reuse. Once you put it in there, it's done. Mm. Um, what can you, you can, but you can reuse beer barrels often, right? Uh, I mean, not that you're doing it often, but. You can. It just gets, it gets a little testy for a couple of reasons. You lose a lot of that spirits flavor because a lot of those are pulled yeah. out in the first beer. And you also open yourself up to introducing bacteria, bacteria and, stuff. and stuff. Anytime you're opening and messing around with a barrel, you. Mm. kind of run that risk um with things like farmhouse ales and, and sours you can use barrels in perpetuity mm. more or less but yeah that's cool um god damn it i keep forgetting my fucking questions what was the question I was just, oh i don't know that would be a fun event though i like when i was thinking about we're doing the barrel aged and cheese pairing event with tim that would be a fun event to do and i was so when on your this morning when I was getting ready, I was thinking it'd be fun to come out to, you know, Woodland and do the same style of event there. Mm -hmm. But that would be kind of fun to do a uh, event where it's like, you know, it's it would probably it would be expensive and you'd have to really, you know, but then you couldn't like be like, hey, it's all day Saturday. But that would be a fun event to do a uh, like actual barrel pool, you know. I think if, if limiting it to like 10, 15 people yeah. and everybody gets a taste because you don't, if you're drinking that much of every right. barrel that's going to be yeah you're going to be tipsy after a few of those but yeah definitely limit it to the group and pick out some barrels ahead of time that yeah. are pretty primo and then you can also I, I love the idea of showing people really what barrel aging does to a beer by you taste a, a beer that's been in a barrel for three four five six months mm -hmm. a beer that's been in there for a year a beer that's been in there for two years plus mm -hmm. like to really track what it means to be barrel aged uh, a lot of times you'll go to the grocery store, beer store, wherever, and breweries are putting out beers that say barrel aged, mm -hmm. which could mean anything. It could mean they spent a day in a barrel, yeah, or they could have spent five years in a barrel. Hmm. Um, and there's a huge difference. I, I pick it up more than others, probably because it's what I do. But uh, it's, I th I think a lot of people could benefit from seeing. Yeah, and tasting what that actually really is. Because there's no reg are there any regulations on the barrel age program like there are like bourbon and it has to age in 
oak barrels for at least four years. So yeah, no, there's there's really nothing. Um, there's like simple rules like you're not supposed to fortify a beer. Like you can't mm. dump a bottle of bourbon into a keg of beer, stuff like that. But yeah. you know, in general, I don't. I've there's no restrictions on hmm. or limitations on what barrel aged is. Yeah. That's wild. But I, I always I always make it a point and people have asked me before, like, why do you why do you put such descriptions and on your labels? I said, Well, I one, I want them to know how long it was in the barrel, but two, like we talked about earlier where someone didn't know what hops tasted like in a Hellas lager. Like it's important to give people some indications of like these are the flavors you're tasting that's that's what that is Hmm. that way when they go back and they go to another brewery they know what tobacco in a beer tastes like or molasses like they they've got some indicators otherwise they're just pulling stuff off of untapped reviews that are from joe schmo that has no idea what he's tasting so right joe schmo if you're out there yeah go fuck yourself (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, what's the... All right, questions I want to ask you. What's okay. the shortest and longest barrel that you have? And what do you think about beer Instagrammers and podcasters and reviewers? And then... <laughs> um, oh, shit, what was that? Oh, fuck. I've had this question. I, I've, I don't know why I have the worst memory today. Uh, what's the oldest barrel that you have right now that has beer okay. in it? So we'll, we'll do the barrel one first. So youngest barrel that I've had that I put out. Mm-hmm. When we first opened in 2016, I did a couple of uh, barley wines. Well, a barley wine, LB Lives. It's like English barley wine with some smoked malt and no treason, which is an Adam beer, German style, smoky. And both of those only spent like three, four months in uh, 53-gallon new oak barrels from Adirondack Cooperage and some 15-gallon bourbon barrels from Black Button in Rochester. Those are, like, my shortest ones. Okay. Um, I think the oldest ones I've gotten now are, like, two and a half years old. Hmm. And after doing the expansion, that was kind of one of my goals with my barrel program is get to a point where all of my barrels are minimum, like, two years. Hmm. For full-size barrels, 15-gallon and 30-gallon barrels, you can kind of shave some time off of that, just like distilleries kind of – they start with smaller barrels because it – the aging process is yeah. expedited, but working towards two years minimum. So my oldest one is three years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I, I Back in May, I went to Portland to see my absolute favorite brewery of all time, Hair of the Dog Brewing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's like my inspiration to brewing my big beers, and he just closed this summer mm-hmm. after 29 years of being open. So when I found out that he was closing, I went out there. like It was on my bucket list. I had to check that off. Yeah, He had a... a Barrel aged, well, his one of his main beers is called Adam, and it was Bourbon Barrel Adam ten years. Hmm. It sat in a barrel for ten fucking years. Wow! It was intense to hmm. say the least. It was like chewy, thick, chocolatey, just hmm. nothing. Nothing that I've ever tasted hmm. compares to to that beer. Not saying it was like the best beer I ever had in the yeah. world, but like the experience of holy shit. Yeah. That sat in a barrel for 10 years. <laughs> I was 27, like, when that was brewed. That was pretty cool. So that, That's wild. taking that inspiration back to, to Woodland, I'm, I'm looking at some barrels and thinking, like, when, what about that one? Yeah. Like, could I sit on that one for 10 years? And what would happen? Like, hmm. that, to me, is pretty sweet to, to, to think about the, the time. And just not the beer itself, but everything that happens around that beer over 10 years. Like, yeah. Because you have no idea what's happening in that. I mean, in theory, you could sit that that beer could sit there for six years and it could go funky right. between year five and six, and you have no idea, right? I mean, yeah. well, you're pulling little tastes. Yeah, I mean, I w- I would know if it went bad yeah. per se, like if it got spoiled, but otherwise, I, I just track it and see where it goes. Like yeah. if if it gets to a point where the beer's this is not good, no one's ever going to drink this. I should <laughs> probably just get it off the the rack and dump it. But yeah, uh, yeah no, I'm definitely trying to, to mm. see which barrels I might be able to go long term on. Yeah, that's wild. Um, what do you think about the beer, the world of beer influencers and Instagrammers and all that kind of stuff? I think they're cute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think a, a lot of it is good in the sense that it makes beer relevant to 20-somethings, yeah. 30-somethings. 
but I think it's lost a lot of where beer culture that I grew up on came from. And I'm, God, I am old. I'm, but I'm not. I'm only, I'm only 37. Mm-hmm. It's not that old. I got into to craft beer kind of at the beginning of the microbrewery mm-hmm. kind of craze where you can travel and find a brewery. Yeah. Uh, where beers were still in six packs of bottles and not cans, where you'd have a growler rolling around the back of your car. And I think m- most people that were getting into craft beer 15 years ago were getting into it not because it was cool or hip, but because they really wanted to taste something that was good. Yeah. Where I think craft beer influencers have kind of just leaned into like, how do I make this hip mm-hmm. and trendy and cool, which is fine. They're not beers that I drink, yeah. but I'm not going to, I'm not going to poo poo on them. They're someone out there is drinking them. So that's good enough. But I, I don't think they've done, I don't think it's done justice to craft beer in general. Yeah. I think, uh, reviewers, I don't, I don't check untapped. Yeah. Cause it's usually really off the mark and it's not, relevant feedback for me mm-hmm. if someone likes a beer great if they don't like tell me why like yeah. give me actual explanation as to why whereas i think a lot of times they don't because yeah. they're not yeah i don't know they're and not I, professionals right they're just and a real food a real beer reviewer it i mean you shouldn't really be judging a beer based off your taste profile you right. should be judging a beer based off of like Technique and you know um, interesting brew methods or t- you know right. pro- profiles, whatever the case is. Or like, uh, if if you're gonna review a beer, at least review it to style. Like, yeah, I <laughs> you, you see, there's a couple of Instagram pages that uh, Pilsnerish is one of them, hmm. um, where you'll, they'll just screenshot the absolute worst untapped reviews, <laughs> and it's like one star. I don't like sours. I was like, oh. <laughs> Why did you drink it then? But there's a lot of that. It's like, if you know what you like, drink those beers. Right. That's pretty funny. Don't review the beers that you know you don't like. What's the (laughs) the point? What good does that do anybody except to get you a cool badge that your friends will see? Yeah. Yeah, that's... uh, When I was doing... When I first started doing the Cicerone course, which I did like a day of online, the it was fun to like think about the education of it and think about the history of beer and then going to branching out and like walking through and like, Oh, I just read about this and I just read about that. But then I f- immediately fell into the untapped world. I was right. there for about 48 hours um, of like this beer, you know, I just read about this and this is a truly historical beer, you know, brewing method and you should try, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I find, that's where I find it. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's definitely, I mean, obviously there's people out there that are bourbon enthusiasts who right. are probably still getting drunk on occasion off of bourbon. And there's also people out there who are, jink- who are drinking, you know, the shittiest Jim Beam and Coke, right? So um, there's space, obviously, for all those people. I just, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's just, I don't know. For me, it's hard to wrap, like I can wrap my head around one thing. And so it's, it's weird for me to think about it in two different things. Like in my head, you're either, I can wrap my head around a brewery that's like, we're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time. We're going to put out beers that people can get fucked up on or come in and get tipsy on. Or I can wrap my head around breweries who are like, hey, I do this and it's really, you know, really well done. And this is a 10 year barrel aged beer mm-hmm. and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so. there's, like you said, there's definitely room for all of that. Yeah. Like there's enough people out there drinking. Mm-hmm. That the untapped people aren't going to run me out of business right. because I'm not putting out yeah whatever beer they want you know um, but it's like food do you ever look at Yelp for reviews for restaurants No I really don't unless I'm in a foreign city I don't I don't ever look at Yelp but I I'll look at Google reviews or Facebook something not Facebook anymore but really Google yeah and see um, or sometimes I'll look at restaurants in the area that have like significantly bad ones um because as much as i do hate as much as i know i mean we just had it happen at the restaurant in the past you know month or so we had you know a person who just you know wanted to be a troll and created multiple fake google accounts to leave us one star <laughs> reviews all based on the fact that we're a ghost kitchen nothing to do with the food or anything like that just 
the review was, they're a ghost kitchen, don't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but valid point. I know. Can you really trust them? <laughs> but they created five Google accounts, separate fake Google accounts, so they could leave five separate one star reviews, which drove our thing down. That's amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so while I like, I know that kind of stuff is valid, but I still like to look and see how the restaurants have responded to reviews mm-hmm. if they responded. Um, you know, I mean. Owning the restaurant now, we've just gotten we we get like it's it's frustrating, but um, uh, we've gotten some one star reviews recently, or like two star reviews recently. Where, not some, we've had like two or three, um, where we only do tater tots is like the only option, and you know our, while our guys are ta- like while well, while the the three guys that we have cooking at the restaurant and they're cooking at Limp Lizard i mean it's it's hard work i mean obviously it's dedication you have to be some sort of fucked up to like be a, have a career as a line cook no oh, absolutely um and so and these guys show up so you know they're you know they're dedicated you can't fault them for that but they just fuck up tater tots it's like you know an order went out where it was like the person that they posted a picture was just pieces of tater tots. Oh. And it's like, what in your fucking head thought that you could send that out to a customer who just paid $15 for a sandwich? Right. You know, like, so I like to look and f- try to find reviews and see if there's consistently over the course of a few months something that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also like to look at reviews and say and see if there's disgruntled employees. If you get a really disgruntled employee, they'll go on there and they'll they'll exaggerate, maybe a little bit, but they'll pretty much tell the truth. Not the I shouldn't say the truth. They'll they'll let you know the shit. Right. And so I like to look for those if I'm looking only if I'm like trying to dig into a restaurant or something. I don't know if I just threw you off your point. If yeah, you're no. <laughs> but, but, so, but there's there's some relevancy to all of those reviews. You yeah. just kind of have to to gauge and uh, yeah compare to other. Right review systems and seeing like you, you generally if you've read bad Yelp reviews yeah you can weed out the ones like this person just is a, can I say the b word on here it's want. just super bitchy yeah. like there's some of those like you check their profile and they've only left thirty comments yeah. and they're all negative about a place like right. that's a person that is going out and they're gonna find something wrong with your place no matter what yeah like Cody Dedishu who had Defi which was like you know one of the best restaurants in Syracuse, fanciest restaurants, had a story of um, uh, cost. He got a one star review one night after a service, and it was just like eating him up, and so he couldn't sleep. And he decided to like open up his phone and and clicked on the person's profile on Google, and and went and read all the other reviews for restaurants. And what he found was like any de- halfway decent restaurant all got one star reviews, but then. The Taco Bell and Maddie Dale got like a five star, <laughs> and the McDonald's and Fairmount. All right. To be yeah. fair, that Taco Bell and Maddie Dale makes a killer quesadilla. <laughs> That's really good. But so I think that kind of, you know, you, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt when, when some of them, and Untapped, I'm sure, well, I'm sure there's people out there that, uh, that go on Untapped and leave just dumb reviews, but I do feel like more reviews on Untapped. I don't really, I want to go to Untapped to necessarily say, is this beer good or not? Mm. Based on people's opinions, I would go on Untapped to say, is this beer popular or not? Sure, you know, because if you know, if you know, Will half in the bag from Willow Rock has like you know five thousand reviews, let's say, but you know their um, their Congress maybe has you know it's a bad example, but Congress maybe has ten reviews. So I'd look mm. at stuff like that if I was on Untapped. Then I would say because everybody's like, t- like today I like this beer. But if it was 90 degrees outside, I'd probably be like, what the fuck is that? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, if it's cold and I want something hearty, you know? So, yeah. So I kind of think about that when I think of people's reviews of beer. The other thing that's really frustrating for me and, and something I, I understand, it's the most frustrating thing for me about local breweries. And that's the inconsistencies in the same beer. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a restaurant in town. I say this about all the time. I could go in there on a Tuesday night and order the cheeseburger, and it's the best burger I've ever had. And I could go back in on Wednesday night and get the same fucking thing from the same person, and it would be the worst burger. Like, the inconsistencies are what drive me crazy in beer. Because um, there's sometimes I'll go in and I'll get the this IPA that they make, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And then I go back 
two, three, four months later and get the same beer. And it's like, what the fuck did you guys do to this thing? Right. You know, that's something about beer I've never understood. Yeah. I th- and I think a lot of that is telling of a brewery. Yeah. And it's telling of a restaurant. If you, right. If you have, especially if it's a mainstay staple. Yeah. Like, how could you fuck that up? Right. <laughs> like, if it's a beer you've brewed before and brew it regularly. I mean, I, mean, I know how they can fuck it up. But right. Should you be fucking it up, I guess, is the question. Yeah. Is no, you shouldn't no, be. No, you shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, like, there's, I'll give, I'll give breweries some leeway, because I think a beer sometimes is like a song. Like, mm-hmm. if, if you're Led Zeppelin and you're playing Cashmere, like, it's a song on recording and then you're live... It's never going to be the same live. You're going to, you know, feel your energy here and there. I think a beer can sometimes be the same way. Like you can have your IPA that's your mainstay, mm-hmm. but you can still switch up the hops here and there. But in general, like the theme of it yeah. should be consistent for sure. Yeah. You should know that this is this is still that IPA. This is still Led Zeppelin Cashmere. Like right. it should be recognizable at least. But See, I... Personally, I want a brewery to pop up in the area that is that. I want a brewery to, uh, to pop up that is like very early 2000s emo and their personality. <laughs> like I want them to put out a beer where it's like, this came from my heart, man. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like um, you don't even know. You know, like <laughs> like <laughs> I, I want someone to show up and make all that they make are those beers. Like, you know, I wrote this song last night, you know, when I was smoking my fucking capris, <laughs> right? Or my cl- whatever. <laughs> like, I want someone to just focus on that kind of beer. Like, you know, wear a turtleneck, maybe a beret, and just talk about, you know, but I picked these that hops. Per- that person's not brewing beer. <laughs> He's sitting somewhere drinking coffee, writing a poem still. Right, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe those are only home brewers, that right? Do yeah, that. that's it. like really pretentious ones. Mm-hmm. Um, my beer's my beer's too good to brew anything bigger than five gallons. <laughs> it's like the demo was better. The five gallons is better. <laughs> they're yeah, they're not leaving their kitchen. Uh, but I do. I I, I there, don't get me wrong. There's times I go out. I just want uh, IPA. Mm-hmm. You know, there's times I go out. I just want a pilsner, whatever. But. Um, I think it would be cool. I don't know if it would be successful, but I think it would be cool to have like an artsy, um, not an artsy, but just like a, a small space that's focused on these are the best of the beers that we could make, like the ones that we're passionate about. Each one has that story. You're not going to come in here and just like, hey, what's like Michelob Light you know, right. or Mick Ultra? You're going to come in and you're going to be told it's going to be an experience. Um, and you can't just come in and order it. You've got to come in and get the story. Um, I wonder what that would look like. And maybe that's not something that should, that's ever going to exist here in Syracuse. Maybe that's something that's going to exist in, you know, Los Angeles or, you know, Denver or wherever the fuck. But, uh, yeah. I yeah, know. I don't know. Syracuse is too much, uh, well, upstate New York very much has that vibe of we've got two middle fingers. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> we're, we're we're angsty. Yeah, we deal with cold winters. Sometimes we just don't want to deal with our emotions. Yeah, you know, sure. I, I feel like there's a lot of that in upstate New York. Where yeah, huh? You think a brewery could? Uh, you think a, a a brewery would do as well? Well, I, I shouldn't say this because I just found out screwball whiskey was invented. Was born in San Diego. Um, but I was, do you think of like a really great brewery comes from a place where people are happy? It should, <laughs> right? <laughs> no one's going to a tap room where everyone's miserable and the beer sucks. Where know? do you think the happiness level is in central New York? If you had to guess, <laughs> if you had to take a stab in the dark at the percentage of people in central New York who are like genuinely happy, uh, what would you say that is? It's probably less than 68%. Really? Just, yeah. Just or another. I don't know. Okay. It's it's it, it can be any given day. I feel like upstate New Yorkers go either way sometimes. Yeah. Whatever way the wind blows. I think I've told you the story in our group message before, but there is this pastor and I I hear this from comedians too. Comedians hate like Syracuse. In the past like 3 or 4 months, I'd say I've heard 
more than a few stories of comedians saying the funny bone in Syracuse is the worst place. <laughs> I've on heard Earth. that too. I think Mark Norman was saying yeah, that. Yes, yeah. he was. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is this pastor friend of mine who, like, you know, world traveling pastor and um, minister, and I I knew him. He wasn't from Syracuse, but I knew him from Syracuse, and uh, and you know, he's like the you know faith, pray for the sick, all that kind of stuff guy. So he's not just getting up there and speaking, mm-hmm. but. Um, when I had just moved to Texas, I s- found out that he was going to be speaking at a church that was like an hour and a half away, and I was just like, ah, you know, I'm going to go there, you know, like I just moved to Texas, you know, see something familiar. So I got in my car and drove out there, and uh, I'm sitting in like the sanctuary, in the church, and listening, and he's like giving the sto- he had like two or three stories, examples in a row of times he was speaking at churches where there was like this massive lack of faith and nothing was happening. And he wouldn't say the city, but as he's like describing the places, I'm like, that's fucking that Syracuse. Sounds that's familiar. The, that's that church and that's that church. Oh, no. <laughs> so Syracuse does get a bad rap a lot. I mean, you know, so I would say, uh, yeah, I would say your number is probably accurate, under 68% of people that are like identify as genuinely happy. Right. You know? And there's a, I think it's, <laughs> Some of the things that make us happy are also things that wouldn't make people in other states and areas happy. Like we're very, I feel like we've also got a pretty dark yeah, sense of humor. Like we, maybe I'm speaking for myself, but like <laughs> <laughs> morbid dark things are, are kind of funny. I think maybe that comes from <laughs> the fact that we don't get any sunlight and it snows eight months of the year. Like I, yeah. f- I feel like you almost, if you have a sense of humor in this area, you got to be able to laugh at some very dumb shit, like, right? Because otherwise, this place will just eat you. Yeah. You know. So I think there's there's that aspect of it all too. Yeah, yeah. Syracuse is a really interesting place when it comes to it's changing, but it is a really interesting place when it comes to you know having a personality. Because I don't think we have a personality. Mm-hmm. You know, I do meet a lot of different people. I mean. I meet, especially at the bar, I meet people who show up and they're like, you know, what, you know, Mick Ultra, what do you have that's closest to Labatt or whatever the case? And then I get people who show up and they're like the snootiest fucking people in the world. Right. You know? um, which of those would you rather serve to? Honestly, I'd rather serve to the snootiest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the, they listen and they, I, I, I uh, I don't know. Maybe I need. I probably need more experience in like busier places. But um, I feel like the snooty people around here listen more to the story. Like they're more interested in the person behind the product or whatever the thing is, um, and they're also more appreciative of it because they have so such little of the culture around here. Right. You know, like one thing I hate about our city is everything's always you're coming up from something. You know, it's like they just did this n- another new mural on the other side of the building over here. It's gore- It's cool. And I love seeing more murals pop up around the city because we have so many ugly buildings, but it's like rising from the ashes. It's like, stop fucking identifying <laughs> with the people that have like been destroyed who are rising right. from the ashes. Like, Start identifying with just people are doing cool shit. Yeah. You know, stop being like, we were beaten down. Yeah, it, it automatically gives, like, a negative tone of, like, right. shit here sucked, but now look at us. Like, yeah, why did shit have to suck? No, right. no it, maybe it didn't. Like, maybe things yeah. just are. When I worked, another church story, when I worked at this church in Texas, my two best, my two good friends were, like, uh, the worship leader, John, who was, like, 10 years older than me, and my buddy JP who was a little younger than me. And we had a group called the Finer Things Club. Uh, so the church we worked at, you had to sign a contract. You couldn't smoke. You couldn't partake of any tobacco products. You couldn't drink any alcohol. You couldn't gamble. And you had to tithe every week. Um, and you had to sign Is the that contract. 10% tithe? Yeah. <sighs> and if you flaked on any of those things, they could fire you. Oh, shit. And so we had this Finer Things Club where, like, once a month we would get together on, like, a late Sunday night. And... We would either like hang out at John's house and smoke cigars and drink a couple beers, and then usually we would find ourselves driving forty five minutes out to Austin and going to like a hookah lounge or you know whatever. So, um, so they were like normal Christians that had to hang mm. out with out there. But anyway, so, but all of the like, all of the 
like emotion. And it was a big mega church. They had like a legit production crew, and they put out really legitimate professional videos and photos and all that kind of stuff. Um, but all the videos that they would put out, it would be like, you know, the husband and wife whose marriage was, you know, like on the rocks. Our kid died and our, <sighs> you know, and he cheated and we lost our job and our tire fell off on the highway. And, but God, you know, or, you know, I was in jail and I had murdered four people and I was on drugs or I was strung out or I was an alcoholic. Yeah. Everything was the worst story. But then I found Jesus, and my buddy John one day was like, I grew up in a great home with parents who loved me, and, <laughs> you know, I got a, I had a car at 16, and, you know, uh, nobody had any addiction of any sort, and my dad wasn't gambling on the, fo- on the you know, horses every single weekend, and I found Jesus. You know, I grew up in a normal home, and I'm but still how? a Christian. But how, <laughs> without that... Without that hero story, how yeah. did you make it there? And that's kind of how I feel about Syracuse. Every time I see a mural that's like rising from the ashes, right. we're coming back. It's like, stop fucking talking about how bad right. shit was right. and that you're coming back from Just it. Just do cool shit. Right. Like, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that has to do with beer or what we were talking about, but that's my... I don't know. All I heard out of that was, make Syracuse great again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did that come from? Who's That was somebody's tagline. What was that tag? Oh, no, did someone that, use that? Trump, no, I think they did. That's, no, that's Trump's tagline. If, I was, yeah. If someone in Syracuse is using it, <laughs> holy shit. Well, I was thinking about... Um, I'm trying to find... I do want to find ways to like be more edgy. Right. You know, instead of just like, go eat local, you know. But uh, um, I was thinking about getting a MAGA hat printed that says, like, eat local again. And I've, I've thought about making, doing one just like, make lager again. Like, make, <laughs> like, but you yeah. know, like, someone is going to be offended by that for sure. Without a doubt. Yeah. You will, yeah. Yeah. You ever watch um, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm? No. There is an episode. Is this the little Hitler kid? Uh, that well, it's Larry David, but, but there is yes. Is yeah. that the episode? No, the episode that I'm talking about is that he wanted to get. He was going to have lunch with some like the you know the feed me Phil guy. He's like an actor comedian, but in the show they were like, oh god, you can never get Phil to stop talking. All he does is talk about himself and what he's doing, and and so Larry got roped into having lunch with him, and so in order to get out of it, he decided to show up to the lunch, but he was wearing a Make America Great. <laughs> So maybe we're in a MAGA hat. <laughs> as he's walking in, everybody in the restaurant's like staring at him and giving him dirty looks. And as soon as he sits down, the guy feels like, oh, I just got a text. My wife was in a car accident. I, I, I can't, I got to go. I can't stay for lunch. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I'm sure that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I'm sure it is. So it would be funny. The funniest episode, the two funniest episodes were. The the episode started off with there was a KKK convention in Los Angeles or a rally, and Larry was walking down the street with a cup of coffee in his hand. He just walked out of like a Starbucks, and he bumps into a Klansman who's who's wearing his robe, and they like bump into each other, and he spills his coffee on the robe, and the guys gets pissed because now his robe stains. He's like, I can't show up to the rally <laughs> with coffee on my robe. <laughs> Jesus. So the whole episode is Larry's like, I'll get it dry cleaned. I'll Let me take care of it. Give me the robe. It's going to come back good as new. Uh, I mean, it was just the funniest oh, fucking man. episode. Um, yeah. Syracuse needs more things like... No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> we don't need more clan rallies. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just... Uh, yeah, it's an interesting city. I like it. I love it. But I wish we were better. That's pretty much it. Well, I think uh, the only way to make it better is focus on the things that are pretty cool and are better. I I don't know. Like eat local New York. That's it. So I've got two final questions to ask you. Um, One is uh, Tim Ferguson. Uh, I don't know if you're friends with Tim on Facebook. Uh, on Facebook, yes. In real life, no. Not not a huge fan of Tim Ferguson. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, if you're listening to this, <laughs> I'm gonna <I'm> get you. <laughs> um, Tim posted a video, like shared a video from two or three years ago of uh, what's the bottle shop over on Tip Hill? 
other not now and later now okay. and later uh and it was from an other half beer launch so other half had brought in like pallets of cans of their beer and there was a they had like a big now and later did a big sale that day and there was like the video just showing people lined or around like the block mm-hmm. you know twice waiting in line to get this beer why doesn't that happen anymore because you can get Tickle Me Elmo on eBay. <laughs> I think it's, I don't know. It's. A, I mean, this is two years ago. It's not like, you know, pre-internet. But you, I was in uh, I was in Niagara Falls this past weekend, take the kids out to see the falls for the first time ever mm. type of family trip. And I stopped in, I don't know, a bottle shop or Tops or somewhere, and there's a shelf with like 10 other half beers on mm. it. Yeah. Do you think that there's a brewery in our area that could ever pull, like, how, like... I think the hype for beers like that is important mm-hmm. every once in a while, um, but I don't know. I have zero clue on how to do that. Yeah, if <laughs> if I knew, I I wouldn't be here. I'd have a line, and I'd have to handle that at the yeah. brewery. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think I think those things come in waves. Like the hype come in waves, mm-hmm. and those things don't sustain. Yeah, like you're not gonna have a a knock on wood that you're not going to have a line for 20 years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. unless you manage to come up with every new trend yeah. spot on. I don't know. Huh, I don't have an answer to that one. I uh, I think as those trends come and go, I think a lot of those craft beer drinkers kind of come and go. Yeah. You ever, do you collect vinyl? No. You ever really listen not. to vinyl? Like, there's No, not really. Well, it's like, I mean, I have like but. any like any collector's hobby. I think that's that's what you're getting with people that are, that do the line thing. Mm. Is you're getting collectors. You're getting the people that I'm not. I'm not saying they don't care about the beer. I'm not saying the beer yeah. isn't great. I'm just saying you get your collectors more interested in those things. But at the end of the day, those collectors aren't the ones keeping those breweries or any brewery open yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. I mean, I might be wrong. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's like, it, and that's a collector culture versus a beer culture in your normal everyday Joe that's coming in to buy a six pack. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. So I think, and the breweries that do that, I'm sure balance both of those things because you couldn't sustain just on expecting people to show up every Saturday yeah. In a line of 100 people, you're still going to need people on Tuesdays and Wednesdays to come in and get beer. Right. Huh. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm starting Others Half, and uh, <laughs> we're going to be we're gonna be creating hype just like that yes. for all of our beers. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, so why do you do what you do? I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm stubborn. I think stubborn might be the word. The... Brewing the beers that I do, I've gen- generally and genuinely and seriously only brew them because I love them. Mm. Like, at the end of the day, I brew beer that I want to drink. If other people are enjoying the ride with me, mm-hmm. that's awesome. I appreciate that. And obviously it helps yeah. to keep the doors open, but I think that's why I keep doing it is I like to have a, a sixth of my Hellas Lager on at home. <laughs> <laughs> that works. I, I do it because I want to drink. <laughs> the uh, it's uh, with even even expanding and doing the, the tap room at the the Holbert House is kind of a continuation of and a hopefully a finality of of my plans. Hmm. When I did the expansion a couple years ago, added fermenters and tanks to be able to handle a second tap room somewhere. Okay. So over the last couple of years, I've kind of been able to payroll that or bank bank that yeah. off of the one tap room. So opening a second tap room kind of is the period to the end of that sentence for me. Mm. Unless anything else comes up and I get an itch to do something different, that's yeah. kind of it. Huh, that's wild. Well, you said it all. Oh, I did. You did all of it. Yep, and the audio book will be out next week because I'm writing yeah. even more. There's a whole lot more to, more to tell. So. Yeah. So just to recap, we have some of the most important things that you've said today in, in <laughs> clickbait form. You hate Tim. His beer is made with poop. 
And uh, and you actually said that once I'm done editing, how much you hate Myers Creek and Empire <laughs> and all those other places. It's true. Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah. And then you're going to be moving everything to your garage in Boonville. Yep. So, Boonville, it is. <laughs> Well, thanks, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me out. Everybody get out to Marcy, New York and check out Woodland Farm Brewery.